brought you glasses. Yes, they're sitting on the other table. Well, I don't know what to tell you, sis.
Yeah.
you, Lord, for being here tonight with us, God. And not just tonight, Father, you're always with us, God. You're there when we need you, Lord. You're there for the good, for the bad. We need to lean on you, Father. You're there. You're constantly on a relationship with us, Father. And we tend to sin, Father. We tend to push you away, Lord. When we really need to get closer and closer to you. Help us, Father, just to let go and allow us to be more like you. Allow us to just rely on you, Lord, nothing else in this world that's falling apart, God. Day by day, we see you in the news, we see you just walking in the streets. This, this world is crumbling, Father. We can't rely on it. We just simply can't. We have to hold strong to your truth, your faith, and what, who you are to us, God. And that love that you provided us on the cross, God. Thank you, Lord, for just being there for us through this time. So, Lord, we ask you to continue to bless this evening as you use Pastor Reuben as a vessel to share your word, Lord. We pray that you bless Pastor Reuben, Lord, as he gives that word out. And at the same time, bless our church, Lord. And help us be transformed for you, Father. Transform to something better, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Calvary Chapel. <laughs> Glad you're all here. Wow, God is good, isn't he? All the time. As Jesse was singing that last song, and, and you'll get this once we get into the message, but it fits so perfectly <clears throat> in our message tonight in Numbers chapter 14. Amen. It's just so crazy. I mean, it's one of those things that you, you listen, because me and Jesse really, really don't talk at all. <laughs> he just hears the Spirit, I hear the Spirit, and all of a sudden he comes up with the songs, and you're like, how did he know that? How did he, he must have cameras in my office, and he watches me as I'm studying or something, because it just fits so perfectly. My theme tonight is fear not. Fear wow. not. So, so pretty interesting. <clears throat> So is God real or not? Amen. You know what's so interesting is some people think that he's not. He's not real. He's not real. Why, why do they think that? Oftentimes it's because they're not getting what they want. They think God should do what they want God to do and not let God be God and lead their lives. And that's a big struggle with them because they feel like God's going to tell them to do something stupid, something dumb, something that's going to cost them. And it's just so far from the truth. They just don't understand. So we pray for them, and hopefully the Lord will open up their eyes. Yeah. If you have a bulletin, raise your hand if you need one. 
Uh, raise your hand if you need one. <laughs> Open up the bulletin if you have one. A couple of announcements. So um, September 4th, which is a week from this coming Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. So a week after, we're going to have a guest speaker here. So uh, spread the news. Uh, he is the founder of the ministry uh, that um, I'm joining and going to the short missions trip that I'm going to. So he's going to come out and share with us, which is a blessing because this guy, um, he probably wouldn't want me to say this, but it's true. He is literally the, I don't know if you've heard of the machine gun preacher. Yeah, in Africa. So he literally is the guy. No. He literally is the guy uh, that founded this ministry. Now, someone else took some credit for it, but this is the guy uh, that was that preacher that went out there and literally wow. fought in, in battle. This guy's an amazing guy. He is, I believe, a Marine, so he runs everything. <laughs> if you ever get the chance, I'll, I'll give you the address to the ministry, or I'll invite you to come out because I go out there twice uh, a month. Uh, on Tuesday and Thursdays. I'd love to have you come with me. We'll just drive together and sit in a meeting, but you can look at this place and it's, it's, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Everything about it is beautiful. It's clean. Uh, it's just a, an amazing architectural thing. And then he has all these trophies on the walls, boar heads and all kinds of amazing, just amazing ministry. This, this man knows order. He knows commitment. Uh, he is a man of God. So we get the blessing of having him out on the 4th. So, you know, you know, I tell him, you know, we're a small church and Wednesday nights are kind of, he goes, I don't care. I'm coming out. I said, like, okay. You don't, you don't say, you know, no to someone that just says, I'm coming out. Okay. So it's a blessing. So invite people to come out that want to know about this ministry and so forth. We won't be recording it because it's going to give some details as to what I'll be doing. So, all right. Um. Let's see, women's study is going on. It's never too late to join them, ladies, if you have not on Thursday nights at 6.30 to 9 p.m. And if some of you want to stick around a little longer, then it will go longer, like 12 midnight. <laughs> ladies just know how to, they've got the gift. You know, God's given them the gift of gab. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Discipleship class is August 29th, so that will be, I believe, next week, Thursday at 6.30 here at the church. And let's see, uh, men's retreat, guys, sign up. We still have uh, room for one day. Uh, there's some commitments there that uh, possibly might and might not, so let me know if you want to go for the full thing. Let's have the ushers come forward, and we'll get into the word, because I'm excited about this. Amen. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, you know what? I changed that. I'm sorry. It's going to be the following Tuesday. Okay. That's right, because this is the old bulletin before I change it. So it's going to be the, for the 3rd, the 3rd of September. So mark that off. Oh, we can't have it on Jeremy's we can? You're okay with it? Okay. We have Jeremy's permission, so we'll be needing him. After. And the discipleship class is for anyone that would like to come on out, ask questions about ministry, about the Bible, you know, anything, and we just fellowship with one another. It just, it, I take it after the model of Jesus. You know, he just spent time with the disciples. And so that's what I want to do. I'm not Jesus. I'm, I'm an under shepherd. But I do the best I can. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer. It's one of those areas. So let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to open up your word and, and dig into it tonight, Lord. We pray that you give us grace and mercy as we go through it. We pray you open up our eyes and our understanding, Lord. Father, there might be some here that just are closed to the truth, Father. They're so closed to it, Lord. They've been hurt. There's some pain in their life, Lord. And they're not willing to listen to the grace that you have for them, Lord. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you remove the walls, Father. Amen. Remove all obstacles, Father, that they may hear yes, the pure word of God tonight, Lord. And be encouraged that God knows. And God has a plan and a purpose for all things in our lives. And he works them out for good, Lord. Bless the tithes and the offerings, Lord. May you be glorified 
in everything that's received, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Let's open up our Bibles to Numbers chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and they will get you one. And it's important that you have a Bible, get a Bible, buy a Bible, so that you can read along with us. Because I'm one that believes that our truth comes from this source. Amen. Truth doesn't come from my mouth. <laughs> it doesn't come from my mouth. It comes from God as he puts it in his word, and I try to expound upon the word of God. And if I have an opinion, I'll tell you that it's my opinion. But normally, I just expound on what is being said here. And I'm careful to do that because I'll stand before him one day and be accountable for what I'm teaching here on this earth. And there's been times where I've caught myself uh, afterwards and I said, Lord, please forgive me for that. I, sh I should not have said that. I wish I would have said this. So I'm my, my worst critic, if you know what that's about. And I'm sure some of you do. So Numbers chapter 14, the theme is fear not. Fear not. You know, Sunday we talked a little bit about relationships as we finished up uh, our relationship part seven. And I talked about my children, right? and how I raised them up and how I purposely did things. And that's how my mind works. I purposely do things. And one of the things that I wanted to do for my boys was to create in them a lack of fear. I wanted them to be courageous. I wanted them to be strong. I wanted them to be men that if they see trouble, they don't run from it, that they go towards it. And it worked. <laughs> God has given them the gift of courageousness. I remember there was a situation out here on, on Etiwanda uh, where a couple of guys were beating up on one guy. And my sons just stopped immediately and tried to break it all up and, you know, disperse the, the people. And they actually got into a, a scuffle with the people that were trying to beat up on the one guy. And that's how courageous they had become. And I remember as they were little kids and starting at a young age, I would put them on the table. And then I would say, I want you to jump into my arms. And so as little kids, they kind of like, you know, do this thing like, uh, uh. So I'd get close at first and jump into my arms and they jump in, I'd catch them. and put them back on the table and I'd pull away a little bit, like, jump into my arms. And, you know, that's when they start thinking, I don't know if you'll catch me or not. You know, and I taught them, trust me and be courageous to jump. And I've always done that with them. Um, when we used to go out to the beach and go boogie boarding and whatever out there in the water, you know, I told them, take the biggest waves. Go for the biggest waves. You know, what, what's going to happen to you? You know, you'll, you'll crash in water. You know, you might get a little shaken up, but that's okay. And they would do that. You know, some of them wouldn't, but the others would. <laughs> you know, they had to learn. So this is about fearing not. Now, that's a reality. That's a reality that we all deal with is fear. Fear. It is one of my issues in sins in my life is fearing man, fearing situations, fearing life. Fearing God, not having the proper fear for God itself. The word fear is used more than any other word in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Wow. Wow. So what is it that we deal with the most? Fear. Yeah. It's fear. It's spoken of over 500 times in the King James Version. Do you know what the second most used word is? Yeah. Trust. Oh. Isn't that amazing? Because we have a problem with trusting God. Because of the fear... It controls us, our eyes are on it, and we're not walking by faith, we're walking by sight, and so we don't trust God that he will help us through the situation. No matter what the situation is, it could be uh, the Red Sea in front of us and Pharaoh behind us coming at us and we're literally desiring to wipe us all out, and yet trusting God that somehow, some way, he's going to deliver us. And then he parts the Red Sea. Amen. He parts the Red Sea. That's how radical... That's how radical God is. And if we trust him like that, he will do it all the time. The word trust is spoken of 147 times in the RSV. Joshua chapter 1 said, have I not commanded you? This is Joshua speaking. Have I not, or God speaking to Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wow. 
How many times are we really strong? How many times are we really courageous? How many times are we really not afraid or not dismayed? See, God is telling us and is commanding us to be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed because I am right there with you. And so the three Hebrew boys go into the fiery pit and Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, there's another one in there and he looks like the son of man. That's how close Jesus is. The song that Jesse sang, he's closer than our skin. Yeah. He's in us. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, even against Satan himself. That's how close God is to us. And I want you to really think about this message tonight because this is the reality. It is the reality. As hard as this piece of metal is, so God is with you. God is with you. God is protecting you. God is leading you. God is guiding you. God is going to put a hedge around. He's got your back. Now, it might not be the way that you want it, but it's going to be his way. And what's the worst that can really happen to us? Death? Well, that's really not that bad. <laughs> because there really is no death. We don't die. Our bodies die. Our souls go to heaven. And we're in, the, we're in the presence of the Lord. So there's nothing that you should be fearing. Nothing that should dismay you because God is with you. I don't care what your finances are like. God will take care of you. I remember there was one time here in this church where we were making the decision uh, on the last amounts of money that we had as a church and we were thinking maybe we shouldn't tithe as a church and we should keep it so that we can pay our bills. And I remember I was a part of this, uh, this group of about six or seven guys and I was one of the guys that says maybe we shouldn't tithe and we should, we should just pay some of these bills. And then I remember another guy who was a guy that had faith in God. He says, no, we need to let God take care of it. And so we all agreed, let's do that. And we had like $1 left. Once we, we took care of everything, paid the tithe and all that. And we were like, okay, Lord, what are you going to do? And then the following Sunday, it all came back. Yeah. It all Amen. came back. And God has done that over and over and over again. I can tell you story after story how God has shown up. In the beginning, it's very difficult because you're learning to trust God. You're learning how God works. And so every time you come up to a situation, you're wondering, how is he going to do this? I don't think he's going to do this. This time he's not going to do anything. I'm going to fall on my face, you know. Sometimes you do, but he gets you back up. At this point in my life, after 33 years of knowing the Lord, I don't even worry about it. I'm like, Lord, you're going to somehow take care of it. Mm -hmm. You're just going to take care of it. I know you're going to take care of it. I know it. And he does because he is faithful. So like Joshua is, it was commanded by the Lord, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. The Lord is with you. And that's to all of us here. To all of you here. Now, we've all heard the words, fear not, right? We all know what that means. And how many fear nots do we find in the Bible? Well, there's a debate over this because some commentators will say that there's 365 fear knots, which is interesting because how many days are in a year? 365 days. And so God has given us a, a fear knot for every single day. Now that's nice and that's wonderful, but that's not the truth. There's more than that in the Bible. And, and I don't care for pastors or anyone that teaches those kind of things. It's my kind of little sensational, like, wow, God really did. If God said it once, that should be enough. Right? Yeah. If God said it once, that should be, if he said, don't fear, that should be enough for to say, man, God's telling us don't fear, then I shouldn't fear. Because that means he's got my back and I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Now the context here is that people are literally grumbling uh, to the Lord and then to Moses because of the fear of the people that they're supposed to go in and conquer these giants. But they, out of disobedience, decided to go up and try to defeat these people, after God says, don't do it then, you're going to wander in the wilderness, and then they ended up getting destroyed. So three points tonight. Fear, first point. Second point is disinherited, and then faithfulness. We'll look at each one of those. So let's look at fear. Fear which, in a lot of cases, controls us. Anxieties, worries, and so forth. Uh, I love my wife, but fear controls her in so many areas. She is so fearful of elevators to get into them. She's so fearful to get in the car with me. I don't know why. 
And she literally has to hang on and look out the side window and not see how I'm driving. And she's been like that for years. I can't break her of that. It has to come from God. You know, it, it's an area in her life that she has a weakness in. And she's been like that. She has anxiety attacks. And some of you might know what I'm talking about. I mean, God bless you. Uh, yes, they're real. And they really happen, especially when you're in the stress of things. I had a, a, a former boss actually ran this whole division. And his son died in a practice football game. Mm. Went head on, head to head, and he passed away. And then his wife blamed him because she didn't want him in football. So their relationship was uh, diminished. And since all of that was happening, his work diminished. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. So they ended up uh, uh, demoting him and putting him in a, uh, actually a whole floor that they were remodeling. It was just him alone. So he had all of this against him. And, and so you can only imagine the stress, the worries, the concerns. It just seemed like life was consuming him. And so he ended up uh, going to Mount Clare they're at the um, train station, and he jumped and killed himself. And he was a strong believer. He was a strong believer. It happens, and people do those things because life is very stressful. And the reason they do that is, is because they're, on, they're focusing on the situations of life and not on the Lord. This is why I believe that we need to focus on what the Word of God says and not on our thoughts. Amen. It's hard to do. If you focus on your thoughts, you're going to be misled all over the place. Your emotions will lead you everywhere. And chances are they're wrong because they're amplified. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, when I first got hurt in my hip, uh, it hurt. My sciatic nerve was, was crushed. And even uh, synthetic morphine couldn't help. It, it would help for a little bit, but it just came back. And I literally laid in bed, found a spot where it just didn't hurt, and I just lay there all day long. And I remember, I thought, I'm going to die. I literally felt like I'm going to die. So I told Virginia, call my boys in. I want them all here. I'm going to tell them where everything is because I'm dying. Now, who's going to die from a piece of cartilage that's ripped in your hip? You don't die from that. Because we amplify things when we're going through pain. When we're suffering, it gets amplified. And you think, I'm dying. So let me tell you guys, I love you. I'm sorry for everything I've done to you. You know, and all of these things. And here, I'm still here today after 10 years of telling them all that. And that's what happens when our thoughts control us, our emotions control us. We need to believe what the word says, what God has promised us, and lean on that more than anything else. Amen. And if you do that, I think that you're ahead of the game. So verse one, fear not. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. So obviously, because of the situation that they were in, seeing the land of Canaan there, seeing the people who were dwelling there, and they did not want to go there because of the report of the spies that came back, and they were going by the report of the spies, and not by what God had already previously told them that he was giving it to them already. So they believed the spies more than they believed God. You ever been there? Where you believe the situation more than you believe God. That's sin. Yeah. Because we're saying, God, you don't know what you're talking about. God, you don't know what you're doing. God, your promises don't happen. And that's sin. And so because of that in their mind, they began to weep, literally weep. They cried. They were, they were anxious. They were worried. They were concerned. It was, it was stressing them out in a sense. And it says the people wept that night. So here's Israel. Stood barely a year out of Egypt on the thresholds of the promised land. And over the first 10 chapters of Numbers, they had been fully prepared to walk as promised land people. They had been ordered, organized, clean, purified, set apart, blessed, taught how to give, <clears throat> how to function as priests, uh, had been made to remember judgments, uh, spared and deliverance brought, and had give, been given God's presence as a guide and the tools needed to lead the people. God gave them everything that they needed there. And God invited them to take the land, and they rebelled through their mourning. They cried, we can't do it, Lord. I can't do it, Lord. I don't have the power. I don't have the strength to do it. I don't know how I'll get through this, Lord. I don't know how you'll deliver me, Lord. Help me. And we cry, and we cry, and we cry. Instead of standing strong in the Lord. Now, I'm the first to say that I've been there. Ministry is not easy. 
And I've been there crying and weeping. I can't take this anymore, Lord. <clears throat> Verse 2. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives, children, should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. So now <clears throat> they're blaming Moses and Aaron. It's your fault for bringing us out here. You were leading us. You were guiding us. And you brought us right here. Oh, they knew all along God had said this. God had prepared the tabernacle. They saw the building of it. They saw the preparation. But now they're putting the blame. Now they're rationalizing. Now they're trying to justify why they feel this way. It's you and uh, Aaron there, Moses, that has done this. And then why would God do this? Why would he bring us out here? Boy, that's when you run into some problems, when you start blaming God. Because the Bible is clear from Genesis to Revelation that God is good. Amen. And we all say amen. amen. We all say, uh, what, what's the other phrase that goes with it? God is good? All the time. All the time. We say that. But the reality is, do we believe it? Yes. That's the reality. Because I don't at times. I don't at times. I don't, I don't think he's good at times. I remember one time I was going through something stressful and I was like, God, why are you doing this? God, why are you letting this happen? And I'm going on and God, you're doing this. God, you're doing it. And all of a sudden God opened up my understanding and he says, why are you blaming me? And I'm like, whoa. I backed off. I go, it's not you. It's people around me. It's not your fault they're doing those things. But you're allowing me to go through this. And I had to confess it. And I said, I'm sorry, Lord, because you're good all the time. Your plans are perfect. There, there is no evil in you at all. There's no darkness in you at all. And so how can I dare blame you for something? So they were justifying. And they're saying, look, he's brought us out here to even kill our wives and our children. They're going to become victims of God himself. And so they're weeping to, to Moses. And then they got the courage to say, we're choosing another leader. We're going to get somebody else to lead us back to Egypt. They knew what was in Egypt. Do you think they really wanted to go to Egypt? No. No, they just wanted to get out of that situation. Verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun, uh, Joshua was the only guy that did not have parents. Did you know that? He was a son of Nun. A son of Nun. And Caleb the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we possess, through, though to spy out, is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the, this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Wow. So, good leadership. First thing that Moses and Aaron do, they go, go to prayer. Pray. Let's go pray. Let's go seek the Lord. We don't, we're not going to fight this in flesh and blood. We're going to fight this in powers and principalities of the air. And they begin to pray. It was Joshua, the young man that stood up. says, what's wrong with you guys? What are you guys doing rebelling against the Lord? Notice, he, notice that he recognized that rebelling against leadership is rebelling against the Lord. He didn't say, why are you rebelling against Moses and Aaron? He said, why are you rebelling against the Lord? Because God chose Moses and Aaron to lead the people. And they should have trusted God's choice in men. And so they were disgruntled with God. And Joshua was like confident Man, we got this. God's with us. And God has taken away all of their power and authority. They can't do a thing. And so we should not fear them whatsoever. So fear. Do not let fear control you. Now, it's easy to say that. It's easy to say that. And yet fear controls us every single day. I remember Jay Vernon McGee was, would say about fear. He says, you know... We have to have good fear, proper fear. 
It's good to be fearful at times. You know, if a lion is attacking you, then fear comes in. And that fear is good because it gives you the adrenaline and all that stuff to run as fast as you can. Right? And you want to run as fast as you can. Reminds me of a story where these two guys were in a forest. And all of a sudden, they were confronted with a bear. And so the one guy started putting on his tennis shoes. And what is the other guy looks and what are you doing? He goes... Hey, all I have to do is outrun you. <laughs> the bear will get you and I'll be free. See, fear is good because in a certain degree it will help you to defend yourself and those kind of things. But the fear that is bad is a fear when we don't trust in God. That is a fear that we need to uh, work on. Now, how can you work on fear? Is there like a plan where you go to the gym and you work on fear? No, you work on fear when situations arise. That's the only way you can work on it. So, so when you do have anxieties, this is how you battle anxieties. You confront it. And you, in the name of Jesus, I'm not giving in to it. I'm going to get through this no matter how my body feels, no matter how much I sweat. I'm going to get through this and God's going to give me victory over it. I know that to be true because I am a part of a dysfunctional family that are all taking some sort of uh, medication for anxiety, for depression, and all of those things. I am the only one in my family that does not take those things. I've been to doctors, and they said, you should be on those things, you know, because you have all the symptoms of it. But I refuse to, because I'm going to stand against it in the name of Jesus. I, I want to get the strength myself through His grace and His power to stand against these fears. And so that's the only way that I can do it. And there's so many side effects with the other items that you just never know what they'll do to you. If you're suicidal, from what I understand, almost all of those medications amplify the suicide feelings, big time. And there are many people that have, been, that have committed suicide. So I stand against it, and I fight it. And it's a daily thing that I have to struggle with every single day. But we can do that, and then God gives us the victory. And then... You get stronger. You get stronger, it gets weaker. And you become victor over it. So I challenge you to learn from your fears. Learn to be strong, to trust in the Lord completely. Like Joshua said, you know, be strong. Don't be dismayed. You know, trust in God. He's right by your side. Now, disinherited. Because of their lack of faith and trust in God, God took his hand away from them. So in the Old Testament, God would have that ability. He would be able to take away the power and the strength from a nation that was against Israel, or he would be able to give them power and strength like Babylon to conquer Israel, depending on his judgment and what he wanted to do. That's all in God's hands. God was also to give Israel what they needed. He was also able to remove it from them too. So God is in control quite a bit of our lives and situations that we go through. And we must learn through them. So he disinherits them. Look at verse 10. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Can I point out something that I just noticed as I was reading this? Notice what verse 10 said in the very beginning, that first statement. All the congregation said to stone them with stones. All of a sudden, they got pretty bold. All of a sudden, they wanted to fight. All of a sudden, they were fighting now against God and, and, and Joshua and Caleb. Hey, guys, let's pick up some stones and just kill these guys. Why wasn't that directed towards the land of Canaan? Isn't that interesting? That we have the boldness. Here, here we might fear our situation, but we don't fear God, and we start blaming Him. He's the one that can destroy us in our situation. And yet we have so much boldness, so much strength, so much courage that we face God himself. Isn't that amazing? And we don't even see that because we don't believe that God is able to do anything. That's why. We believe he's there, but we don't believe that God will correct us or chastise us. And so we don't fear him properly. We don't fear him at all. And that is an issue that is an issue with us. See, all of a sudden they're, no, we can't beat them up. We can. We, we can beat up Joshua and Caleb and you, God. We can take care of you. <laughs> really? Really? What kind of boldness is that to go against God? And we do it all the time. We do it all the time against God. So be careful. Be careful. Channel 
your courage and strength in the right direction. Channel it in the right direction. Don't channel it against the guy that's helping you, that's got your back, that's going to support you, that's right by your side. You're fighting the wrong battle at that point. Uh, what, there's a word that they used to say, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Yeah. And we do that all the time. Why is that? I don't understand it. Pride, the pride of life. You know, the pride of life, wanting to get our way. And so they wanted to pick up stones and stone them. But the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. God wanted to make a point to all of them because they're all witnessing this. These spies come in and they're distributing this message that they can't do it, which caused fear with the whole community. That happens. That happens even in churches where one man can start a fire and the whole church is starting to run because of the one man's uh, rumor, in a sense. And you know what they say, if you tell a lie long enough, people believe it. Mm. You just got to keep telling it and eventually people believe it. <clears throat> so what happens, verse 11, then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and, in dis and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. See, God can't infringe on in our free will. They had a choice. They had to choose to go in or not go in. So he, he won't infringe on your free will. You can receive him or... You can reject him. That's up to you. That's your decision. And we all have that free will to do so. God presents the gospel. He presents the seeds. He does the watering. He does everything for you. But you're the one that has to do it. As Justin would say, you know, God would <clears throat> cook the meat for you, put it on your plate, cut it up for you, put it on the fork, put it right by your mouth. He'd actually stick it in your mouth. But who has to chew it? You do. And God can't chew for you. So you have to make that decision. You have to do the research. You have to study. And I encourage you to do so. Find out whether this is true or not. That's your responsibility. And so here, um, the Lord rightly rejects them, disinherits them. And he has every right to do so because they were disobedient to them. And he said, I'll raise up a greater and mightier nation than these people. And Moses said to the Lord, and this is interesting, and I find this interesting. Now, remember, the Bible is a history. It's a history book about Jesus. It's about his story, mm -hmm. Jesus' story. And so it records history. Yes, it's filled with doctrine, but it's also filled with historical facts. It doesn't try to cover up things. So you'll see things like Abraham having two wives. You know, you would think, well, the Bible teaches Abraham that we should have two wives. No, it's just telling you that's what Abraham did. It doesn't approve of it. Okay, it doesn't approve of it, but it's telling you honestly, and it's being transparent that this is how the people behave themselves. And I think that's what's happening here. Because God is God. You I mean, if God knows yesterday, today, and tomorrow, nothing surprises him. And so you don't sway God to do something as though he needs swaying, right? In other words, when he makes up his mind, he knows what he's doing. But I think he allows us to commune that way so that we learn something. Uh, I think it's in Deuteronomy, we'll see later on, that God says that these things happen to you because I want you to know your heart. I don't need you to, sh to show me your heart. I already know your heart. But I want you to understand your heart. And so a lot of things happen to us because God wants us to understand our weaknesses, our strengths, where we stand with him. Are we faithful? Are we not faithful? Those kind of things. And so Moses here, all of a sudden, is trying to talk God out of this. And I find that hilarious. Like, how can you talk God out of doing something? But, but he does. And then he feels, and I don't know where he's at here, is my opinion, but he might have felt a little good. Oh, I was able to talk God out of it. No, you're not talking God out of it. He, he, his, his, his word is still going to stand. He's still going to discipline them. It's just going to do it in a different way. So Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear it, because he's now saying, you can't destroy them because Egyptians will hear it. For by your might, you brought these people up from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land, or this land. And they have heard that you, Lord, are among these people. That you, Lord, are seen face to face. And your cloud stands above them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man... Then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land, which he swore to give them. Therefore, he killed them in the wilderness. So you see what Moses was doing there? 
Like he's like reverse psychology here. Wait a minute, Lord. Don't you understand? You brought these people out here. And now everyone who's seen you bring them out here in a great mighty way, are going to say he brought them out there to kill them. It's like, what kind of God is that? Now there's some truth to this. There's some truth to this. Is that our actions as Christians can bring a bad name to God by what we do. And every time a man falls, every time someone sins, every time you misrepresent God, there's that one person that watches and says, wow, see, I told you. And they call themselves Christians. And there's some truth to that bumper sticker that, that says, I'm a sinner, but I'm saved, though. I'm not perfect, but he's perfect. And we all fail, but don't use that as an excuse. Please do not use that as an excuse. We represent God. We're to be light. We're to be salt. We're to walk in a right way. And we need to do that because it does bring a bad name on God. Now, God still uses it somehow in some way. And God's going to change his mind here, but it's not that he changes his mind. He's just going to do it a different way. But he likes the passion of Moses. I mean, Moses loved the people. He didn't want them destroyed. He didn't want God's name to be defamed at all. And so in a sense, he had a passion for God. And now I pray, verse 17, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, that's not a generational curse, guys. What he's saying there is a repercussion of sin. If I sin, that sin can possibly go down to my children and their children and so forth because of my actions. And, and the results have a tendency of going on and on and on. So that's what the Lord is saying. It's not a curse. You're cursed now and then your children are cursed and their children are cursed. No, that's not what he's saying here. But when God says to do something and you don't do it, there's repercussions. There are repercussions, and we need to understand that. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap, right? Uh, they teach you in school the laws of, uh, uh, what's, what's uh, uh, I forgot it now. The, the law of when you do something, something will come back. I forget what that law is. <clears throat> but the same point, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap, cause and effect cause and effect, right? Yeah. Whatever you cause, there's going to be an effect on that. So he goes on, verse 19, pardon the iniquity of this people. I pray according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. So he heard the Lord. Now, sometimes I do pray this prayer. Sometimes I cry out to God and I say, God, you called me. I don't know how many times I've prayed out when this church has gone through things. I go, God, really? You, you've done all this? To all of a sudden say, okay, you're no more? That don't make sense to me, God. So I know that you're doing something. And I know you're going to somehow make it work. You didn't do all this to all of a sudden close us down. Has that happened? Yeah, I'm sure it has. Where churches are, are, are starving and they're trying to change. And so they do these great things in, in a hopes that somehow it's going to draw people. And then it doesn't. But see, the, the heart is different there. They think it's in the thing you're doing that's going to draw people in. It's not. It's God. Because it's God who draws men to himself or drags men to himself. But when your heart is, I just want to do this to glorify you. To, to have a place where your people are comfortable. Where they can come in and not focus on, oh, look at those walls when they should be paying attention to the word. Mm -hmm. you know, And they can be fed and strengthened in these things. So I do that sometimes. Lord, you didn't, you didn't do all of this to just bring it to nothing, Lord. So I'm going to believe that you're doing something and you're going to continue. Amen. So third, faithfulness. Faithfulness. And we see that in, in Joshua and Caleb. God loves faithfulness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much you're doing. Just be faithful with what he's given you. Be faithful with what he's given you. That's what he looks like. That's what he looks for. It's faithfulness. If you're a new believer, be faithful to seek him. It's all he's asking of you, to read his word, to pray, to be in church, to be connected. Don't worry about works at this moment. Don't worry about doing things. Right now, I just need to be faithful in growing, mm -hmm. understanding who God is, deepening my relationship, strengthening my faith, strengthening my trust in him. I gotta focus on that right now so that when I get into ministry, when I start helping and things seem to be falling apart, I can face it. 
with the things I've learned already. And if you are in ministry, be faithful with it. Don't slack from it. Continue in it, no matter what it looks like. And if God is, is done with it, let him take it away. Don't let someone else take it away. Let God do, the, do that if that's what God wants. You just be faithful to the very end. As Greg Laurie uh, shared one time years ago, that he's been all over the world teaching Bible studies and so forth. Churches invite him all the time. And, and a lot of times the churches are packed out. And he said that he went to this one place. And as he got there to, to preach, there was like maybe 10 people there. Mm. And he just thought in his head, wow, only 10 people are here. <laughs> but he says, I was faithful to teach as though there were a thousand people there. Yeah. And so it's about faithfulness and trusting in God. So be faithful. Look at verse 21. But surely, truly, truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Isn't that interesting? Ten times these people were testing God. So it wasn't just a one-time deal. God was patient. It wasn't like all of a sudden, oh, you failed once, you're out of here. No, it was ten times. They kept doing it. You know, they say that if someone uh, has a habit, it's hard to break that habit. And then normally if a person is someone that comes in and divides people, it, it's hard to get them out of that type of mentality. Uh, it, won't, it won't break unless they really want to face that challenge to break it because they know it's sin and it shouldn't be in their lives. But that's up to them to do so. It's very hard to do. So ten times and, you know, that's it. Ten times was enough. And certainly uh, shall not, they shall not see the land of which I swear to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. That's interesting. He has a different spirit. What kind of spirit did he have in him? He had the spirit of courage, the spirit of strength, the spirit of trust. They didn't have that spirit. They had a spirit of fear what he's saying there. Different spirit. We should seek that spirit. Verse 25. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So keeping his promise to Moses, okay? Uh, the Amalekites, these guys are down there. Um, don't go that way. I want you to head out to the wilderness. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you, who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make, I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, uh, shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the blunt of your infidelity. Ooh, infidelity! Wow, unfaithfulness to God. Mm. Isn't that interesting? God considered it infidelity when you're not trusting Him. Yeah. Now, here's the good thing, guys. This is Old Testament law. Mm. Old Testament law is harsh and hard and judgmental because they were under the law. And so God would immediately judge them when they weren't obedient. We're now under grace. Jesus died on the cross and he paid for the penalty of our sins. It's done. It's settled. So all of our rebelliousness has already been paid for. See, they're paying for their rebelliousness. Jesus paid for ours. So we don't live under that penalty. So God is patient and gracious with us. He lets us go through these things and rebel so that we learn lessons and then draw, he tries to draw us back into that relationship with him. He doesn't take care of us. But it's still true. It's still infidelity. It's still infidelity. But we're not going to suffer the consequences like the children of Israel. God will take his hands from us at times and not bless us enough. And he'll quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
He won't do the work that he really wants to do in our lives, but he won't take your life. He'll put you on a shelf if he has to for a while until you learn, but you're still alive and grace is still there and mercy is still there. And it, it, it's interesting because some guys that will come in and they'll become very uh, divisive in here and so forth and they think they're going to leave and do this great work. It doesn't work like that. You can't, you can't treat God's people that way and then think you're going to go off and do a great work. God won't allow that. It's going to fall by the wayside. We have to be careful of that. Jesus said, have you not, have you not heard that if you... Or have you not heard thou shalt not commit adultery? Right? Now, he said heard. He didn't say read. Right? Mm -hmm. Heard because this was the religious people's teaching to the community. You do not commit adultery. So he said, you've heard them say that before. He says, but I say this. You don't lust for a woman. Because if you lust for a woman, you've already committed adultery. It's in the heart. So he tells us don't do this, but he's telling us your heart is already doing it. You're already that wicked. So I've covered that by my blood on the cross. So when you lust, you can confess that to me and I'm faithful to forgive you because you're working on that and you're a work in progress. That's how grace works. It's still infidelity and you may suffer because the man will reap what he sows and you'll suffer those consequences. But he says infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. Forty days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year. Namely, 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Wow, 40 years being rejected by the Lord. Now, he's passing judgment down on them. So you can imagine what they're thinking in their mind now at this point. Boy, we've made him mad. Here we're coming against him instead of them. And now he's telling us what he's going to do to us, which he was going to do to them. And so now we're suffering because of our lack of faith. And I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now the men who Moses sent out to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, remained alive of the men who spied out the land. The faithful were alive, the unfaithful were not. So God judged them because they spread the lies. They spread the report, and so God immediately plagued them. And some have said it was worse than the Debonic plague. Mm. It was horrible, horrible plague that came upon those 12, except for Joshua and them. <clears throat> Verse 39, Moses told these words to all the children of Israel and the people mourned greatly. Now, they, now keep in mind, they're seeing this, they're hearing this and they just saw what God did to these guys. So listen to this. And they rose up early in the morning, went up to the top of the mountain saying, here we are, Lord, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised for we have sinned. And so now they're finding courage to go in there now and take care of it. And Moses said, um, no, no. Now, why do you transgress against the commandment of the Lord? No, 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 no. For this will not succeed. Do not go up. lest you be defeated by the enemy. For the Lord is not among you. For the Malachites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Isn't that interesting? These are people that want to do it their way. I want to do it my way. I just saw what God did. Okay, now I'm going to do it the way you wanted me to. And so now, now it's too late now. It's too late now. Uh, you can't go in there now because I've already taken my hand off of you. I've already promised what's going to happen to you. And you can't go in and take care of that. See how we think sometimes? We do something and we oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Can I go ahead and do it? Nope, you can't do it. It's too late. You now have to suffer the consequences of your sins. And so God is going to judge them. But they presume to go up to the mountaintop, nevertheless. They just don't, they just don't want to hear God. <laughs> they don't want to believe what he has to say. And they presume this. They presume, isn't that interesting? Presumed. Now, presumed is going by thoughts and feelings, right? 
And that's what they're going by, their thoughts and their feelings, because they just saw this massacre. Oh no, that's going to happen to us. We don't want that to happen to us, so let's do this, and he's going to back us. See, you can't tell God what to do. You can't direct God. Let God direct you, and you'll be blessed. That's the first thing of the promised land. First rule, let God direct you, and he will bless you. Be obedient to him, and he will lead you and guide you to prosperity. He'll give you a victorious walk. But if you want to do it your way, uh, he'll let you, but it'll be a little harder. And you'll be going around in circles, because they're going to wander for 40 years. And they're all going to die, except their children, who they said would possibly die. And they'll raise up, and they'll go in and take the land. So they presume to go up on the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. So they were obedient. They were faithful. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelled in the mountains came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormat. So the Lord was victorious. Turn to Matthew chapter 14 and we'll close here. <clears throat> You remember the story of Jesus and the disciples who were in the boat on Galilee. The waves were tossing back and forth and contrary to the wind and so forth. It says in verse 24 that they were in the middle of the sea. The, to the waves were tossing them back and forth and the winds were blowing. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him, Walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. <laughs> and they cried out for fear, for fear. Here they're in this storm, this life situation, whatever it is. And you might be in a storm, in a life situation. And you might be thinking, man, this is hard. I'm not going to make it. This is too difficult. I'm just going to rebel. I'm just going to do what I want because I just don't care anymore. I don't care if I die. Too much for me. And then all of a sudden they see Jesus. Oh, something's wrong with me. I'm seeing ghost. <laughs> Can't be Jesus. Can God come out and save me? Would he do that? Of course he would. And immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Aren't those great words? Amen. God wants you to know, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not. That's a command, right? Do not walk on the grass. <laughs> do not bite your nails. You know? Do not do those things. Do not be afraid. He doesn't want us to be afraid. Don't worry. Cast that away and say, Lord, you're with me. It is I, Jesus. I'm with you. I'm here. We have to believe that. We have to work on that as we go through things. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter had to come down out of the boat, and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, and it was blowing, and it was flowing all over the place, he was what? Afraid. And beginning to sink, and he cried out, just like the children of Israel, saying, Lord, save me. He was afraid. Save me. He began to sink to the lack of faith in Jesus. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? See, New Testament grace. A little different than Old Testament, right? Where God says, Oh, you little faith. Now I'm going to wipe you out. <laughs> New Testament. Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. He got in the boat and he calmed the wind. That's grace. Amen. That's what grace looks like. Yeah, we rebel, we cry, we weep, we're fearful, anxieties, all of these things. Oh, we have little faith that God's going to do anything for me. He'll do it for everyone else, but he can't do it for me. <laughs> oh, yes, he can. Little faith. And he'll do it in spite of you to show you that he's faithful, that he loves you dearly. The Bible says he has a a plan for you, a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11 says very clearly. So do not fear. Now I say that and I know that won't be a reality until you go through something. And then you tell yourself, I'm not going to fear, Lord. I'm not going to fear. When I went to uh, India, I went to India twice in a row in two years. 
<clears throat> and one of the things that I feared was getting lost and being out there in a place that I have no idea where <laughs> things are at. There are no streets and so forth. And in both situations, I got lost <laughs> out there where I didn't know. Uh, one guy gave me instructions on how to get onto the next flight, and I didn't follow those instructions. And somehow I was outside of the airport. And now they wouldn't let me back into the airport because of security and so forth. Even though I had a passport, uh, I didn't have my tickets with me because they were in the airport where I was going to pick them up. You know, and I couldn't convince the guy who had a rifle, and he was a military guy, and he wouldn't let me in. So there I am now. My plane's coming, and I'm outside of the airport. What am I going to do? You know, and immediately I start feeling, okay, Lord, I guess I'm going to die out here. I'm going to have to sleep out in the street somehow. How do I get a hold of the person that's in charge that sent me out here in the first place, which was nobody but me? Um, so I'm in trouble. And I just start praying, Lord, how are you going to work this out? And it's interesting because this uh, Muslim young man comes up and he sees me standing there and I'm talk, trying to talk to the guy and he says, what's going on? He goes, you're from America, right? And they can tell. He goes, yeah. He goes, oh, America. He goes, what's going on? So I tell him, he goes, oh, let me talk to him. He starts screaming at the guy. Ah! And he's like, nope, I'm not going to let him in. <laughs> so, yeah, so now it's a battle between him and the other guy. And so he says, well, do you have anything that resembles a ticket? I go, I might have an email that showed me the flight plan. Let's look it up. So I didn't have Wi-Fi. So he did a hotspot on his phone. Amazing technology in crisis. <laughs> and I was able to get Wi-Fi. We looked it up. He goes, there you go, right there. And he showed it to the guy. And he said, oh. That's the Lord right there. That's the Lord. You don't have to fear. It's a scary place. I remember um, part of India, they took me to um, a marketplace. And I wanted to see, you know, some of the things they were selling. But they had started to walk into these stores. And over there, uh, everything's piled up. So if you had a building like this, the, the store front would be outside. This would be packed. And there would only be aisles. And so all of a sudden I find myself walking in hours and they're walking way ahead of me and I'm trying to follow them. and there's all these Muslim people and all these and I'm walking through this I'm like, wow, Lord, this is interesting. You know? and, I, and I didn't fear. I didn't fear at all because I knew that I was in the hands of God. That was a scary situation to be in. Very scary. And I'm walking among all these. I was in the airport in Mumbai and that's nothing but but uh, Muslims there. And there I am, the only American, and everyone out in their wardrobes, and I'm in line waiting and listening, and I'm just like, whoa, this, it feels so strange being here, knowing that I'm vulnerable, but I was in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. A little fear came up, but I said, Lord, you're in control. Stay calm. Don't stick out. You know, if you, if you have to say something, just scream it out. Rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> just walk away. Because <laughs> that's how they were. I remember one guy just... He, he decided he was going to cut the line. And there's this whole line. And he just walks up to the, to the front. And the guys go, what are you doing? And they start arguing. And he goes, what's one more guy? Don't worry about it. One more guy. What's one? And he was just saying, one more guy's not going to kill you. Let me, let me stand here. And they did. Because you just forced your way in. <laughs> That's how they are. Interesting. God is faithful. We don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. But that takes time. So work on that. And I pray that you will. And, and you'll see how faithful God is. He is faithful. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And Lord, this message tonight was powerful, Lord. Yes. It's very powerful and will help us because it's the number one thing that we all go through, Father, is fear. And we allow our thoughts and our emotions govern us, Father, leading us, guiding us, and it just makes things worse when we need to just rest. We need to rest in you, Lord God, just as, as Jesus made it so clear uh, to Peter, Father God, not to worry, not to fear at all. Be of good cheer. Laugh about it. Say, wonderful, God is good because he's there with us. It is I. Don't be afraid. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for watching with us. Bless the Lord Almighty. Amen.